This is part three, chapter 19, Friday, January 3rd, 1986. A locker exploded at Hawkins High, says Powell. Homemade bomb. Chief Calvin Powell has never been one to overreact. From what I understand of the Hawkins Police Department, Hopper was the stubborn, unpredictable one. Phil Callahan, Powell's once partner and now deputy, standing next to him, looks like the aloof member of the a bunch. This makes Powell the one with the head squarely on his shoulders. Now I see why he was made chief after Hopper died. But both Powell's and Callahan's signatures, signature demeanors have been wiped off as they stand out, stand in our front doorway, snow falling slightly onto their jackets, delivering the news with grim effect. May we come in? Powell says, walking through the doorway before Dad can answer. I'm halfway down the stairs and about to go to go back up when he spots me and says, Ah, well, we'll want to speak to you, too, Lucas, if you don't mind. I freeze mid-step. Talk to me? Yes, son, says Powell. Then to Dad. If we have your permission, Charles... Dad shoots me a look. Dad shoots me a look. My heart skips a beat. What did he do? Dad's voice shifts to the lower register he uses when he's upset. Nothing, nothing, Powell says. We just need to ask him a few questions about another student. In no time, we're arranged in the sitting room. Me sandwiched between Mom and Dad. Callahan and Powell, opposite us, with st steaming coffee mugs in front of them, and Erica poised in an armchair, in an armchair, watching everything unfold with interest. So let me be sure I have this right, Dad is saying. A high school kid made a bomb at home, rigged it to Lucas's friend's locker, then went away for the holidays. Not quite, but close, says Powell, not touching his coffee. Callahan, on the other hand, blows steam off the top with intense concentration, as if he'd rather be doing that than talking about a bombing at the high school. There must have been some sort of disagreement, says Powell. That's how these things always start. And so the aggrieved kid goes home, plots revenge, puts some explosives together in his parents' garage, and rigs it to his nemesis locker at, at school. But it's the end of the semester, so the school closes. Kid forgets, leaves for a winter vacation, and then over the break, when the janitors are prepping for reopening, fumigating, and painting lockers, good old Reggie finds that one of the lockers has its hinges, has its hinge, its hinges loosened, tampered with, as, as if someone was looking to steal something. So he decides to fix that. He takes the door apart, and just when he pulls it open, Powell shows his ten fingers. Boom! Oh, my God, says Mom. I hope Reggie's okay. He's a lucky man. The metal door shielded him from most of the explosion. He escaped with a few first and second degree burns from the heat, but is otherwise fine. Holy! <clears throat> Dad catches himself. How does a kid even make a bomb? It's not hard. This is the first time I've spoken since the police arrived. I've been too shocked talking, taking this all in. My mind racing through different things without pattern. Jay, Lee, Garraway, the move bomb, Uncle Jack's words. I don't know when my mouth opens and words fall out. Callahan stops blowing on his mug and turns to me. Is that so? Yeah, I say. We tried to do it once, my friends and I, back in sixth grade. What I don't say is that I tried to get my friends... What I don't say is I tried to get my friends to do it after I've, I'd have i overheard some kids talking about it during Halloween trick-or-treating. I want to... Sorry. I wanted my Rambo costume to be so real that I'd set off a bomb in character. A real bomb. 
but Will and Mike chickened out and left Dustin and me to do it. We didn't end up doing it because even though we got the parts we needed from the auto shop, we couldn't get a hold of either the propellant we'd uh, need to make a nice blast, so we abandoned the idea. How would you do something like that? Asked Powell, whipping out his notebook. Want to run me through it? I take him through the materials needed. A metal pipe, gunpowder or, propell- or propellant, batteries, fuses, and a trigger, which I'm guessing in this case was a, was a string tied to the door, just like the glitter bomb. Powell takes, down, takes us down unceremoniously. And just for the record, he, he says, you're not the one who planted the bomb in Jermaine DeMario's locker, are you? I'm taken aback by the question. Sorry, what? You seem to know a lot about making bombs, Callahan chips in. Now hold on now, Phil, Dad says Dad. Don't come into my house and accuse my son of things. Charles, relax, says Callahan. We're not accusing anyone of anything. We're just clarifying. Why wouldn't I plant a bomb? Why would I plant a bomb in Jay's locker? I ask. He's my friend. Uh, well, I've seen friends do some nasty things to each other, says Powell. But I just want it on the record, is all. Is this an interrogation? Erica butts in, because I know you're not supposed to interrogate a minor. Should we get a lawyer, asks Mom. People, people, Powell says, rising. I just need to know Lucas didn't do it, so I can ju- so I can have justifiable cause to pursue other leads. Jay and I don't mess with people's lockers, I say. It's our lockers that, that gets messed, up, messed with. This gets Powell's attention. He sits and whips his book open. Want to repeat that for me, son? I freeze, remembering what Jay said about accusing the Garraway gang without evidence. You have to tell me, Lucas, Powell nudges. That's the only way I can bring whoever did this to justice. Sorry, I just lost my place. (laughs) You have to tell me, Lucas, Powell nudges. That's the only way I can bring whoever did this to justice. Lucas, if you know something, you better speak now, says Dad. I don't know who, I say, but earlier in the week, someone put a glitter bomb in Jay's locker and mine. Did you report this, asked Callahan. I shake my head. Dad turns to the men. You spoke to this Jay person, Cal, or his parents? Oh, yes. We've been over to, at the DeMario's, says Powell. Reaching into his pocket, in fact, I have something to show you. He lays a picture on the coffee table, and we all crowd in. The photographs show the aftermath of the explosion. Soot and scorch marks spread from the locker onto the hallway floor and wall, telling the tale. The blasted door, now warped, is there, blackened. But the photo is focused on what's painted on the inside of the door. At first, I'm not sure what I'm looking at, because the spray paint has has dripped before drying. Therefore, the graffiti's qu- quite difficult to decipher. Then I realize what it spells at the same time. Mom does, with a gasp, and Dad and Erica do, their faces tightened. My insides recoil. Jermaine said he didn't write that, says Powell. Now I suspect decent young men don't go around graffitiing slurs on their friends' lockers. He trains his gaze on me, especially not you. My educated guess is that the same person who rigged that explosion wrote this. I feel too many things at once, anger, sadness, confusion. Exactly how I felt the first day I heard about the move bomb. I clench my fist to, to I, I clench my fist my fists to keep my hands from shaking. Oh, this is nasty, says Mom, rising infuriated. Nasty. She leaves the room. Dad, whose expression has darkened far more than I've ever seen. Did they write that in my son's locker too? We didn't check specifically, says Pal, but I'm guessing not. We scanned every locker and found no incendiaries anywhere else. My guess is whoever did this was targeting Mr. DeMario specifically. He looks at me. 
I'm only here because Mr. DeMario told us about the glitter bombs and mentioned that your locker was rigged, too. I was hoping you had seen or heard something that may help us. Chief Powell gaze, gaze intensifies. If there's anything you know that may be of help, now's the time, Lucas. Everyone's eyes are on me, even Erica's. I'm thinking hard, wondering if there's if there's a way I can point them in the direction of Garraway and, and his group. When it suddenly hits me, I jump to my feet. The camera. Powell lifts his eyebrows. What camera? If I may ask, when did you say the bomb was put there? Sometime within the last school day is our guest, says Powell. Mr. DeMario mentioned that he didn't open his locker at all on Friday. So we're guessing that saved him and delayed the explosion. I'm sure that whoever did that must have known this and made maybe tried to get into school later or something. But the building's been locked since that Friday, with only the janitorial access to the hallways. Head janitor says no one's allowed in except Principal Higgins, not even the basketball games over the break. He pauses. Why? I think... My mind races. I think I may have something. I go upstairs and return with the camcorder. Mom is back in the living room, and when she spots the camera, she opens her mouth to say something. I'm already rewinding, pushing play, setting it to fast forward. I put the camcorder on the coffee table and peer at it. Everybody, everyone crowds around. What are we looking for here? Callahan asked, but I just put up a hand. Wait. The video begins, offering us a good view of the hallways, framed by the slits in the locker that I'd um, that I'd beat open. It's clear enough to make out the faces of students as they go by, but more importantly, what they're wearing and what they're carrying. This is all Friday, Powell asks. I nod. He takes out his notebook, settles in with us, and watches. The first tape turns up empty, just a bunch of students zipping past the locker at every period bell. The second tape stops right before period ends. It's unclear how much time is lost before I put in the third tape. The third tape, too, turns up empty and even shows a recording of me arriving to take it out and put in the fourth. Then midway through the fourth tape, I spot something. It's the middle of the second period after lunch which means no one should be out, but someone is, a group of someones. The group crosses the front of the camera, moving quickly, stealthily. Stop! I lean forward and rewind, pausing when I reach the desired timeline. There. Leading the group is Lee Garraway, his freckles unmistakable, and in his hand, also unmistakable, and and, 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 and defiable, is a metal pipe. Hey, you guys, if you've enjoyed uh, chapter 19, uh, this is a different recording that I've ever done before. So write in the comments if you're if you like this recording, if you think it's better than my other recordings I've done in the past. Thanks for listening. And I'll read chapter 20 very soon.